Good. Okay. Okay. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for attending this week's uh, Wednesday Encompass seminar. Today, we have a, a special guest. We're honored to have Dr. Anthony Didlake speaking as an invitee of the Rasmus Compass Student Seminar Committee. This year, the committee solicited uh, nominations for invited uh, speakers and voted on a select few to invite to our seminars. Um, Dr. Didlake was one of the nominees who received an overwhelming number of votes, and so we're very thankful that he's agreed to speak with us today. Dr. Didlake is an assistant professor in the Department of Meteorology and Atmospheric Science at Penn State University. His research spans a large number of topics concerning tropical cyclones, especially on using radars and numerical models to study cloud processes in these systems. His research group has collaborated extensively across our field, including with many scientists across the street at NOAA's Hurricane Research Division. Today, Dr. Didlake will be discussing the role of asymmetric features during secondary eyewall formation and tropical cyclones. So Anthony, you want to take it away? Sure. Hi. Uh, thanks, Quinn, for the introduction. Um, thank you all, uh, uh, particularly to the, uh, to the Rasmus uh, students for uh, the invitation and, or the voting and, and the invitation. Thank you to the rest of the department for having me. Um, virtually uh, in this uh, virtual seminar format. Let me make sure, 304, okay. So I wanted to um, uh, present to you all some of the work uh, that my group has been doing uh, to analyze um, rain band uh, dynamics and how they play a role in uh, secondary eyewall formation um, in tropical cyclones. Uh, so this is work that I've been doing with um, a couple of my former students, my former PhD student, Chow uh, Mu, uh, my former master's student, uh, Katie Wunsch. Uh, here we have um, Rogers and Reesers of HRD, Wen Chow Lee from uh, NCAR, uh, Robert Nystrom, who used to be a student at Penn State, and the late Fuching Zhang from Penn State. Uh, it's is sponsored by NASA and NSF. All right, so let's. Uh, I'm going to spend a bit of time uh, going over um, some of the fundamental um, uh, pieces in, liter in the literature that talk about eyewall replacement cycles and secondary eyewall formation. Here we have a radar loop um, showing uh, uh, Hurricane Harvey in 2017. And you can see in this radar loop uh, a, a lot of the rain band spiraling around the storm um, as it's uh, rapidly intensifying. Uh, but eventually, this spiral rain bands turn into a, uh, a clear convective ring around the inner ring of the eye wall. And that uh, outer ring eventually replaces the inner eye wall uh, as part of this eye wall replacement cycle. Uh, this is a commonly, uh, frequently observed inner core process um, in tropical cyclones across the world. Um, and they're there have been a, a, a lot of um, studies that focus on this because they pose a unique um, scientific problem and forecasting problem uh, as they involve intensity and structural changes in TCs that aren't always, um, that are not fully understood and they're not always well forecasted. So eyewall replacement cycles um, can be broken down into a, a few uh, discrete uh, steps here. Um, here we have an example from uh, Hurricane Gilbert, uh, where we're looking at the winds at flight level from reconnaissance aircraft. Um, here you can see marked by eye is the inner eye wall um, at, on September 11th. Over time, you can see outside of this inner eye wall that is then, uh, contracted and becomes stronger. Uh, you have, uh, uh, there, are, there is rain band convection outside of that inner eye wall that coalesces into a, another a secondary outer eye wall, and it actually over time can create a secondary maximum in the tangential winds, which is much more clear here on September 14th. Uh, this is all shown here by a contraction of the, this maximum, um, and, if we, uh, and, and a strengthening of that maximum as well. If we look at a vertical cross section of the convection that's associated with uh, the secondary eye wall, you can see that um, this primary eye wall, of course, has this in up out feature. Uh, and the new eye wall uh, has this, the same in up out feature, not necessarily as deep, but you can see you still have this uh, boundary layer inflow that's feeding into now preferentially into the secondary eye wall um, over the inner eye wall. 
And uh, it turns out that this inner eye wall, uh, or sorry, the outer eye wall can impede the overall uh, vertical and, and radial circulation of the inner eye wall um, and help uh, cause the inner eye wall to weaken. Over time, you can see this inner eye wall tangential wind maximum weaken. And the outer eye wall now assumes the maximum winds of the storm, replacing the inner eye wall, but at a larger radius. And here we have the wind speed of the central pressure, the wind, the wind speed and the central pressure around this time. You can see both dip very drastically um, as the inner eye wall decays. Sorry, the central pressure rises, the wind speed dips. So those were from observations. Um, uh, this eye wall replacement cycle uh, is pretty it's pretty well captured in, in modeling simulations of sufficient uh, uh, resolution, um, which are all which are most uh, mesoscale models these days. Uh, here we have from Rosoff et al. Let me move my Zoom thing. I don't know if it's a good place for it. Oops. Okay. And here's a plan view of reflectivity showing that inner eye wall um, strengthening at first and then an outer eye wall developing and eventually uh, strengthening and replacing the inner eye wall itself. If you look at the axisymmetric average, so taking the average around the storm and looking at specific uh, features over time, you can see in the reflectivity, which is again shown here, you have this inner eye wall once you get to about 100 and 15 hours here, uh, there is another eye wall or reflectivity maximum that now contracts. And that's your secondary eye wall that's formed and this entire replacement cycle is shown here. Uh, and it's associated with a vertical velocity maximum, a tangential wind maximum, and a radial velocity, uh, uh, these are our local maxima, uh, all associated with this contracting outer eye wall. It's pretty uh, all involving um, uh, 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 circumstance here uh, that occurs in the inner core of a tropical cyclone. So uh, one part of the eye wall replacement cycle um, that I, I focus on is the secondary is the forming of the secondary eye wall, which is where that inner core rain band convection coalesces um, and forms that tangential wind maximum and uh, secondary wind maximum. So a variety of physical processes have been proposed um, to explain secondary eye wall formation, but um, there hasn't been a consolidated theory. Um, I've, I've listed a bunch of them here. Um, this is, of course, an incomplete list um, of SCF theories. Uh, and I'll also go over just a few of them here just to so we know what context uh, that we're looking that we're dealing with as I'll be uh, talking about uh, how rain bands can contribute to secondary eye wall formation. So the first one here is the wave mean flow, or the second one is the wave mean flow interactions that involve vortex Rossby wave propagation. Uh, so this uh, is, uh, deals with the vortex Rossby waves that can uh, be propagating inside of the inner core of a storm due to the radial gradient of the, tint of the vorticity. And so this was, uh, was popularized by Montgomery and Kallenbach, 1997, where they showed that you can have these vortex Rossby waves, um, whether they be wave number two or wave number three, this is a wave number two structure. Here you can see oh, at time three, uh, they're uh, pretty spiral, they're spiral outward or inward um, at time three. And then over time, uh, they tend to become skinnier as well. And as they become, uh, Skinnier is a technical term. Um, as they become skinnier over time, they also slow down in terms of how they propagate outward and they can actually stagnate um, at a specific radius. And that uh, stagnation radius, um, uh, active stagnation radius is where momentum can be deposited. And they hypothesize that this persistent depositing of momentum can uh, be a pathway for secondary eye wall formation. Uh, but if we look at some um, full physics models uh, in, in, in some previous studies by Juten Chen and Chu and Tan 2010, uh, they uh, didn't really show, they showed that there wasn't a clear connection between the vortex Rossby waves and the actual secondary eye walls that can form in these full physics models. So here we have um, 
the tangential wind uh, over time in, in this study and uh, in, the, in, the contour, in the field contours and the black contours would be the vertical velocity. You can see this uh, enhanced vertical velocity speckles here um, at a specific radius. That would be the stagnation radius where they showed vortex Rossby waves actually do propagate outward. But they showed that the secondary eyewall that formed came from uh, inward spiraling P, uh, rain bands or uh, potential vorticity anomalies and not necessarily were connected with the uh, vortex Rossby waves that were shown. Uh, in Juden Chen, what they uh, showed was that the moat, which is the quiet, which a, a relatively quiet region, uh, convectively quiet region between the inner eye wall and uh, the outer eye wall, um, or the forming outer eye wall, there tends to be a, a, a region where vortex Rossby waves uh, can't uh, uh, penetrate. And so they showed that um, the vortex Rossby waves stagnate at a slightly inner radius than where the secondary eye wall starts to form. One other way to think about uh, secondary eye wall formation is, is by looking at uh, convective heating anomalies uh, occurring from outside of the, that inner core um, and how they interact with the the upscale with the larger vortex. Uh, one way in which that happens uh, from Rosoff et al. 2012 was that um, leading into secondary eye wall formation, uh, we generally do see an expansion of the wind field. Um, this is a commonly uh, observed uh, phenomena that, um, that happens before the, form, the eye wall actually, secondary eye wall actually forms. And uh, what they showed was that uh, you have increased rain band activity that coincides with that expansion of the wind field outside of the inner core. And that leads to an, act, an increase in the inertial stability of the storm. Uh, here we have a plot in colors, or, or I'm sorry, in gray here, showing the inertial stability increasing over time. And that increase in, in inertial stability um, allows for the, the convective heating to um, more efficiently convert the kinetic energy or more efficiently convert the heating into kinetic energy of the storm um, at this specific radius. So here we have in white showing that uh, the secondary vertical velocity maximum um, uh, happening at the same time as you have an increase in inertial stability and that's uh, uh, showing uh, so yeah, this is the secondary vertical velocity maximum. Um, here we have the heating in the dashed line, and you can see it spikes at about the same time as the kinetic energy uh, responds to that spike in the heating due to the, the increased uh, efficiency. Uh, another way to think about uh, another uh, approach to secondary owl formation is understanding how the boundary layer plays a role um, so there's been a, a few papers that look at uh, the axisymmetric dynamics in the boundary layer. Um, so, uh, there are two ways to think about this. The first one uh, by Wu et al, Huang et al, Bark and Montgomery papers was uh, by looking at uh, what they noticed was that uh, at the eye radius of the secondary eye wall development, um, there tends to be an outward pointing a super gradient force um, in the upper regions of the boundary layer. And that occurs at about, in this uh, diagram, at about uh, 125 kilometers here radius, um, where you have your inflow in blue and outflow in red here. And this radial outflow is super gradient in, in the sense that you have an unbalance, an imbalance in the radial uh, momentum equation. And this uh, concentrates, this radio outflow or the outward pointing uh, super gradient force helps to concentrate the convergence at this uh, radius. And the convergence that is concentrated here um, tends to build a sec, uh, helps to build convection and, and the secondary eye wall ring that can occur as a result. So they emphasize the importance of that outward pointing super gradient uh, force. Um, another uh, approach was from Keppard, uh, Keppard and Nolan, and what they did was looked at an analytical, uh, did an analytical solution and an, a, a nonlinear boundary layer model, and they found that um, you can have a frictional updraft that can develop uh, in, in areas where you have a bump, bump is a technical term, 
in the uh, gradient wind vorticity. Uh, here we have this gradient wind vorticity in the dashed here. Um, and you can see this is the vorticity of the inner core. And then it's not necessarily a secondary maximum in the vorticity, but it's uh, a stagnation in how it changes. And now we have a sharp gradient in the vorticity that occurs here. And it's at this location, um, uh, this vorticity uh, field is uh, driven by the free troposphere. At this location is where you can have a, a frictional updraft shown here in the black. And that frictional updraft can help uh, concentrate even more vorticity at that location uh, through vortex stretching. Um, and that leads to a positive feedback uh, that can create a secondary eye wall um, at this location. So another way to think about secondary eye wall formation is by having a very clear focus on the rain band processes. Um, uh, specifically the stratiform rain band processes uh, outside of the inner core, uh, outside of the inner core. Uh, this is a diagram from Jean Guidal 2017, where he showed that uh, you have your eye wall convection that can occur at a radius where you also have the, uh, the maximum winds. Uh, overall, on an axisymmetric uh, plane, you can have an, uh, uh, the projection of outer rain band convection that has a PV source in the upper regions. Um, and this is mid-level PV generation that is uh, uh, you know, consistent with the stratiform rain band processes. And this is uh, this uh, heating here that can occur in the stratiform rain band convec uh, region uh, eventually uh, goes downward um, in, in towards the boundary layer. And that downward um, extension of this uh, heating or uh, strata convection uh, is what helps to create a secondary eye wall um, at the outer radius. And this is a top-down uh, interpretation of secondary eye wall formation. I think of it also as a stratiform to convective transition. And one thing that they uh, discussed a little as well as to how this uh, mid-level um, or stratiform uh, heating here how that uh, couples with uh, the boundary layer or how that couples with the overall evolution of the storm. Um, so one approach that uh, Wang et al. 2019 showed was that this uh, stratiform uh, heating uh, helps to uh, create um, a sufficient amount of rain band convection at a specific radius that uh, can't be uh, filamented apart. Um, instead, it, it just is able to maintain itself and uh, actually symmetrize around the storm. Another way to see how the stratiform region connects uh, to uh, the SEF, a secondary eye wall formation, is uh, by showing what Chu and Tan showed was that this uh, actually helps to enhance the super gradient flow in the boundary layer. So this is connecting back to uh, the Abark and Montgomery and Huang et al. studies. Uh, connecting back to the Keppert studies, um, uh, Jean Guidal 2017 said that this uh, stratiform heating actually helped to create a vorticity, uh, uh, that vorticity bump um, that builds a boundary layer uh, frictional updraft. Uh, there are other studies that talk about uh, the, the role of the enhanced latent cooling uh, that occurs when you have a stratiform, um, a pretty prominent stratiform convection. And that's actually the, role, the, the, the path that I'm going to be talking about here is trying to get a better understanding of how exactly do stratiform rain band processes um, uh, play, uh, how, do they, how do they impact and, and play, uh, play a role in the early stages of secondary eye wall formation. Um, I'm specifically going to talk about uh, how does environmental wind shear um, contribute to this uh, stratiform rain band uh, influence uh, role in secondary mechanism for secondary eye wall formation. All right. So in order to um, or to start up this uh, part of the talk, uh, uh, 
I wanted to talk about how environmental wind shear impacts the rain band, specifically uh, the rain band asymmetries that can occur. So when we say environmental wind shear, I'm talking about a deep layer wind shear. So looking at the difference between the 200 to 850 millibar um, wind shear in the, in the field out to, I'd say out to 800 kilometers from the storm center. If you have a wind shear vector that is pointing up here, these rain bands uh, can organize, tend to organize into a stationary band complex where you have a, a more predominant convective precipitation on the right hand side, right, right of the shear vector. And as you, the rain band complex, uh, as the convection uh, matures and decays, it collapses into a predominantly stratiform precipitation left of the shear vector. And this rain band complex is, um, is uh, aligned pretty, always tends to be aligned with uh, the wind shear as long as the wind shear vector, or as long as the wind shear is uh, sufficiently strong. Uh, one uh, way that we talk about how different azimuthal regions of the storm play a role in the overall evolution is by putting them, dividing them into four different quadrants. And I'll be using this uh, terminology throughout the talk, rest of the talk, where we have our downshear left quadrant, so down into the left of the shear vector, our downshear right quadrant, our upshear left quadrant, and upshear right quadrant. So this would be a hand, nice handy tool um, or a, a point here to memorize these four quadrants if, if you're not familiar with them. All right, so a couple of um, studies that I did, I've done in the past uh, looked at how uh, the stratiform rain band in this rain band complex, generally in the left of shear part of the storm, how does it play a role in changing the overall, uh, the overall structure of the storm and how does it play a role in secondary owl formation? Well, when we look in the stratiform region of the storm, uh, we saw in using um, airborne Doppler radar data from, uh, this was from Hurricane Rita in 2005 and during the Rain-X field project and Hurricane Earl in 2010. Uh, this is from the P3 tail Doppler radar. This is from the uh, Eldora radar. Now, looking at uh, just in the downstream left quadrant of the storm, what, you what we found was you have this uh, inflow here in blue that's also sinking and the vertical velocity is shown in the dash and the solid contours. So you can see this very clear descending inflow pattern that's occurring right in this region on a mesoscale level. Uh, and this descending inflow goes all the way into the boundary layer where there is some clear local enhancement in the inflow in Rita. And you have rising outflow that's occurring just outside. And we, uh, and we also saw the same thing in Hurricane Earl, this clear descending inflow uh, uh, towards uh, the lowest levels, and you actually had an updraft that occurred right here. So this uh, descending inflow is driven by um, the latent heating and cooling within the stratiform region itself that creates a, a horizontal buoyancy gradient and, and also creates a, a horizontal vorticity uh, as a result. And that horizontal vorticity is manifested in itself in this uh, uh, inflow. Uh, the other thing that we found was that this uh, inflow um, is occurring again on a mesoscale level. It tends to accelerate the local tangential winds, both in the mid levels and in the low levels. In the mid levels, uh, it's clearly advecting higher angular momentum air inward, and that helps to um, broaden the wind field in the ways that we see, particularly uh, prior to secondary eye wall formation. And this is uh, that broadening in the wind field is something that we saw both in Rita and in Earl. Specifically in Earl, um, it was strongest in the downshear left quadrant where we uh, also saw that uh, mid-level descending inflow. And the mid-level, and that increase in the winds uh, were also concentrated at a specific radius. And when we saw that increase in the winds concentrated at specific radius, it turns out in Hurricane Earl, that was also the, uh, near the radius that we found um, that an eventual secondary wind maximum for the secondary eye wall. 
So there was some clear evidence in, in uh, the data here in Hurricane Earl where that um, axisymmetric secondary wind max was actually happening right in the same region where the MDI was accelerating the winds the most. Now, when you, uh, we focused on specific quadrants, we also saw that the downstream left quadrant had that strongest um, enhancement in the secondary tangential wind. So there was uh, some clear evidence, and uh, this is from Did Lake et al. 2018, that uh, this MDI uh, helped to form uh, the secondary wind maximum of the secondary eyewall. And this is just, again, showing that in a conceptual model where the MDI in the downstream left quadrant was created by um, the negative buoyancy of the latent cooling. And it went all the way into the boundary layer where it helped to develop um, the local tangential wind maximum. And eventually there was convection that was also a part of this uh, sustained updrafts uh, that created the developing secondary eyewall. All right, so that's, this is from a couple of case studies, uh, again, Hurricane Rita and Hurricane Earl. I was really interested to see how we can, I'm still interested to see how we can um, look at uh, the ubiquity of um, this uh, mechanism that's happening in the downstream left quadrant. Now, um, at the time, we didn't have a, a, a all of, uh, well, I will say at, at one way in which we were able to look at this is by using um, flight level data. Uh, now, with flight level data, you can't get the full three dimensional wind field at all locations. But what we can track uh, is the tangential wind evolution over time. Um, and we were able to do this uh, using a composite analysis um, that examined um, axisymmetric and asymmetric characteristics of the kinematics. We also looked at thermodynamics. Um, of all of the storms, I believe, um, I believe Katie went back to the year 2003 or two. Um, and uh, what she did was looked at divided storms into three different groups. Um, uh, those that uh, were intensifying, um, but did not undergo eyewall replacement cycle those that were undergoing an eyewall replacement, that did undergo an eyewall replacement cycle, but those um, profiles that were prior to the formation of the secondary eyewall, um, she grouped into another group. And then looking at uh, the TCs that were clearly after um, the SEF uh, formed. So we had our intensifying cases that were non-SEF cases, our pre-SEF and our post-SEF cases. And so looking at the uh, horizontal profile of um, tangential wind, we were able to composite them into um, uh, these three different graphs here um, once we normalize them by the radius of maximum wind. And what you can see here is that in the post SC, uh, in the intensifying group in red, uh, the vertical or the radial profile of tangential wind is uh, lowest in terms of the value of tangential wind compared to the other two. Uh, there are statistically significant differences between that in the pre-SCF and the post-SCF group. So over time, going from intensifying, we can think of this in terms of um, a time evolution, a composite time evolution. So intensifying storms that don't necessarily have an SCF, or you can say it's the first stage, but when you compare that to the next stage in SCF, um, so just prior to SCF, you have a clear broadening in that tangential wind profile, very clear in this composite. Um, and then over time, you have uh, an even broader wind field uh, for the post-SCF uh, group here. Now, this uh, normalization with uh, just one uh, radius of maximum wind here at R1 uh, doesn't really capture what's happening at the radius of secondary eyewall formation because that can vary from storm to storm. It does vary from storm to storm. So to account for that, um, we actually did a second uh, set of normalization um, where we looked at um, R star star instead of R star, where R star star would be this, the radius at which the secondary eyewall eventually formed. And, and you can see that pre-SCF, um, there's not a clear uh, secondary wind maximum at that point. It hasn't actually formed yet. But post-SCF, there is a small bump that represents 
uh, where the SCF actually formed. So we were interested in seeing how particularly these two um, compare to each other when we look at the asymmetric um, uh, uh, evolution going from pre-SEF to post-SEF. So bringing us back to our um, idealized uh, tropical cyclone, uh, we know that um, most tropical cyclones that experience some wind shear have a rain band complex um, in, in, the, in these outer regions, and we can think of them as being in these four quadrants. Uh, we don't really view the rain band complex with our uh, flight level data, but um, we can make some, uh, some connections between the two. So here we have in the pre-SCF stage, uh, the four different quadrants uh, with these four different uh, profiles here. And here we have the post-SCF stage and the four different quadrants. Again, these are showing where uh, different profiles are statistically significantly different. So in the pre-SEF uh, wind field, we saw that the broadening of the wind field was most prominent in the downshear quadrants. Um, here you can see this uh, downshear right and downshear left as uh, clearly stronger um, than uh, the upshear quadrants here. Now, if we look at um, the post-SEF, you can see that the secondary wind maximum um, is visible in all the four quadrants in this post-SEF group. Uh, Pre-SEF group uh, doesn't have that clear um, secondary wind maximum. That's just, that's just by definition of how we define our two different groups. Now, one of the more interesting things here was when you take the difference between the two quadrant profiles going from uh, pre-SEF to post-SEF, what we saw was that um, the most prominent increase in the secondary wind maximum, well, first of all, all of the four quadrants had uh, some increase going from pre to post, um, particularly in the radii where we have uh, the, the secondary eye wall uh, forming. So that's uh, uh, connecting back to what we showed before, where the axisymmetric secondary wind max was occurring near the radius of, of greatest DVDT. But specifically in the downshare left, um, you have in this blue here, uh, the, uh, the uh, largest increase in the winds. Um, and this is something that we saw also in Earl. And one possible reason for this was uh, is it could be the influence of an MDI if it were there, um, uh, particularly in the strata uh, that are connected to the stratiform dynamics of the, the rain band complex. Uh, so a pretty, pretty consistent story going from our case study radar um, analyses to this flight level analysis of uh, composite storms, uh, just looking at the tangential wind profile and, and how they change going from pre-SEF to post-SEF. All right, so I'm gonna uh, finish off with uh, focusing on some, uh, a study that my former student, Chris Yu did, um, looking at, uh, this was recently published in January in JAS. Um, what we looked at was a model simulation of Hurricane Matthew in 2016. Um, so this is a wharf modeling a model simulation with um, uh, assimilated uh, data uh, from the wharf EMKF, EMKF scheme. And this is uh, assimilating all the conventional observations and also the airborne Doppler radar observations that uh, were flown, that were collected. Um, this is before Matthew. Um, turned north. I don't know if everyone remembers Matthew, but Matthew came from the east and then it made a sharp tour north and then it went towards Florida and the rest of the, oh, I'm sorry, you guys remember Matthew if you're from Florida, of course you do. <laughs> All right, so we have here our, um, tutor, our ob observed track and the observed in the wharf track and they're pretty similar to each other. And uh, the same thing with uh, the intensity. So we, what we did was we took this uh, full physics simulation that had, and we found that it had a clear secondary eye wall. And I wanted to, we wanted to see what role the, the rain bands were playing in the secondary eye wall. That was um, shown uh, that you can see here in the Hovmahler diagram of vertical velocity. Here we have the eye wall, um, inner eye wall that eventually decays once this outer eye wall 
uh, forms and spirals and, and, and goes inward. And uh, it's around this time is where you have that replacement. So what we're focusing on here is everything that's happening uh, just prior to this uh, formation here. So hours 15, 17, and 19 is where you can see the in the plan view of the reflectivity. Uh, this green line is showing our vertical wind shear vector. In the plan view of reflectivity, we see the, the strengthening of a rain band complex outside of the out, out inner eye wall. Um, over time, hour 21, 22, 23, you can see that secondary eye wall um, consolidating itself. And by hour 23, we have a clear concentric eye wall structures, and you can see what happens after that, the full on replacement. And so just recall that this is all uh, relative to the shear vector in the green. So what we wanted to do was um, do a very uh, a detailed um, a, a look at um, what's happening at specific times uh, in the, within this rain band complex to see if we could uh, if there were hints of uh, the, the the different observations that we saw in previous studies. Um, the first thing we looked at was the tangential wind acceleration that occurred prior to SCF. So here at hours 15, 17, and 19, um, you can see in the plan view, uh, we have um, our four different quadrants. And in hours 15, the reds are showing more acceleration, positive acceleration. Uh, you, you can see, though, that in hour 17, there are hints of very large swaths of positive acceleration, both in the downshear right here and the downshear left quadrants here, where originally it was just in the downshear right in hour 15. You could think about this as being a, the, the, evolu the, the growth of the rain band complex going from convective and then maturing and then becoming more widespread in the through the stratiform regime. And then by hour 19, you can also, you can then see uh, an extension of that positive acceleration region. Uh, this is actually part of the, the um, axisymmetrization process that's happening in the secondary, for the secondary eye wall to be forming um, after hour 19. So this is in the plan view. Uh, in the, the cross section here, and these are azimuthal cross sections. Uh, you can see uh, at hour 17, I'm actually going to talk a bit about hour 17, a clear uh, low level enhancement at, at, at about 50 kilometers radius of the winds. And that same enhancement actually propagates inward and strengthens. And this is where we have an enhancement, the enhancement that is a, a feature of the developing secondary eye wall. All right, so I'm going to focus on a couple of things. One thing is what we see is that uh, at hour uh, 17, the, this broad swath is indicative of the broad, this broad swath of, of, of acceleration is indicative of the broadening of the overall wind field. And you also see uh, these regions here in the downshire right and downshire left quadrants. So what exactly is going on here? Uh, in, other, in order to understand what's happening in terms of what's causing these, the acceleration of the wind field, uh, we did a quadrant uh, or did a, a budget analysis of the tangential wind, where we have our terms, uh, our terms that are all contributing to the, the full uh, axisymmetric tangential wind um, uh, evolution. And we have here our four, our, 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 uh, the components that are, are the, the terms that are contributing to the acceleration here, and this being a radial evection, azimuthal evection, vertical evection, pressure gradient, and other forces and other terms here. All right, so we focused on just the downshear left quadrant and the downshear right quadrant. And if you look at the actual um, tangential wind change uh, between our, I think it was 16.5 and our 17.5. Um, you can see clearly uh, within uh, these two dashed lines, which is where we have a lot of our accelerating uh, winds, you can see uh, that uh, there's uh, a couple of different areas of positive acceleration in the downshare left, and it looks slightly different from that in the downshare right. Uh, 
We actually did uh, uh, did these terms um, in an integrated uh, fashion uh, to compare the the instantaneous calculations and the integrated calculations to the actual um, tangential wind uh, change. And these turned out to be uh, nicely uh, similar to each other. And so in order to understand what's happening, specifically at hour 17, um, we wanted to analyze this particular uh, slant-wise inward descending pattern of positive acceleration here. And what we found was that um, so just focusing on a few terms here, the radial advection and the azimuthal advection and their sum, uh, we saw that uh, this horizontal advection is a dominant contributor to the, the total um, tangential wind acceleration in this quadrant. So here you have this positive region that looks very similar to this uh, slanted positive region here. And I'm not, I, I didn't show the vertical uh, advection, um, but it's it's clear that the vertical advection pattern is not being um, is not uh, is not widely contributing to this, and neither are any of the other uh, terms here. So this horizontal advection is the dominant contributor um, to this low level uh, acceleration, which is what we want to focus on here in the axisymmetric um, contribution. And it turns out that we can think of this in two different steps here. Uh, the, the, in the upper regions, you have um, azimuthal advection that imports some of this higher angular momentum air from the downshear right quadrant um, into the downshear left quadrant. And eventually, we, uh, in the radial advection um, takes over uh, when we go to the lower left part of this region here. And uh, we this uh, radial advection by the mid and low level inflow is um, of course drawing an angular momentum inward uh, as we'd expect. And it turns out that this local acceleration is due to a stratiform mesoscale descending inflow that we were able to find in this uh, simulation here. Uh, one way that we captured this uh, descending inflow was by focusing um, solely on a few uh, ways of cap of, of solely on um, uh, negative vertical velocities, pixels that had uh, this uh, overlapping negative vertical velocities and also a negative uh, radial um, velocities, uh, which is actually a irrotational velocity here um, given by U chi. And what we found was that this, uh, this overlapping of uh, of uh, um, irrotational, the irrotational wind component of inflow and uh, negative vertical velocity, uh, there's only one region in, a, in this uh, evolution of the storm here in the Hobmahler that this happens, and this would be in the downshear left. You can see at hour 17, a clear in the blue here, a clear region where this is the only place in the storm that is this strong. And you can see it uh, growing and actually uh, evolving over time and, and, and moving downwind. And this is the, the MDI uh, that, uh, that we are able to pull out and, and highlight in this, in this study, uh, in this model. Now, uh, yeah, the shading is the negative U chi and the, blue, the red contours are the negative uh, vertical velocities. Now, how does this compare to um, the overall wind acceleration? Um, well, this is, uh, sorry, how does the MDI um, accelerate the local wind? Uh, so what we found was that when we look at just these pixels where you have your, um, your MDI type flow, uh, of course, it is helping to accelerate the winds shown in red here. Uh, so DVDT is pretty strong um, in this region. And it's all solely due, uh, largely due to uh, the negative um, or the radial advection component of the, the, the momentum budget. So this MDI is clearly contributing to a wind acceleration um, that propagates downwind into the upshear left quadrant, um, more so than in any other uh, quadrant where you have this uh, same feature. Now, why do we focus on this? Well, I've always uh, hypothesized that there's some clear connection to this MDI and having being 
it of a stratiform um, uh, origins, uh, there's actually, uh, what I'm showing now is that there, what I want to show here is that there's a stratiform to convective transition, a very clear stratiform to convective transition that occurs only in the down shear left quadrant. And what we see here, uh, looking at a slightly smaller radius, now going from 20 to 40 kilometers, um, at this same uh, time and uh, azimuth, uh, throughout, stemming from the down shear left quadrant, you have a clear, uh, these reds showing where um, the acceleration is happening, uh, DVDT. And you also have in these contours showing where the vertical velocity or updrafts are prominent. And you have, a, so this is showing that clear updraft uh, source is happening right here in the downshift left quadrant, and it's particularly helping to um, accelerate the local winds. So what we hypothesize here is that these, this MDI, MDI is uh, triggering the updrafts just um, slightly inward and further upwind, and just upwind of where we have um, acceleration of the wind. Now, uh, here we have um, hour 19. So hour 19 is this dashed line here, and it's uh, where we uh, saw that extension into the upshare left um, in an earlier slide. Uh, in hour 19, uh, you can see in the reds here are the vertical velocity. Here's that clear updraft um, that is right at the location of the downwind stratiform region and the MDI. Um, and it's not yet wrapped around the storm. Uh, in the colors here, we have uh, the theta E. And you can see this uh, theta E uh, pocket of the storm uh, 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 clearly along the theta E gradients is where you see your um, largest vertical velocity. Uh, and this is, of course, where the rain band complex is. Uh, particularly, though, in the downshear left, this is clearly revigor reinvigorated uh, upward uh, motion that um, what we are, what we hypothesize, and UN did late 2019, was that it's uh, triggered by cold pool dynamics from the NDI, and this uh, updraft, uh, is very strong updraft, persistent updraft. You can see by hour 20, it's marching around into in hour 22, marching around into the upshear quadrants, and this is actually where we marked the axisymmetrization of the secondary eyewall convection. So we are still. Um, trying to, uh, we're still working on uh, connecting this uh, secondary eyewall for, uh, uh, formation, the axis symmetrization of these uh, updrafts uh, to get us, uh, we're still making the connection between the rain band complex and that axis symmetrization process. Um, we're getting ready to submit a paper that uh, shows a PV analysis that uh, is pretty convincing for um, how from this uh, rain band convection point of view, um, you have this convect stratiform, the convective transition um, in the downstream left quadrant. That is the source, main source of the of the PV that eventually gets um, axisymmetrized around the entire storm. Okay, so to conclude, um, I hope I gave did justice to a lot of the secondary IO formation theories that are out there. Um, uh, uh, many of them uh, do focus on, on, on axisymmetric um, dynamics. Uh, what I wanted to do here was uh, particularly talk about the asymmetric role of rain band convection in uh, sheared storms. Now, when we talk about uh, sheared storms, the way that I think about uh, the role of the shear is that it helps to um, organize where you have um, a, a clear region of the, the cooling. I think the cooling is what is, the, the latent cooling is what is helping to, of course, trigger the cold pool dynamics and eventual updraft. Now, that's not to say that the that's the only that shear is the only way that you can have um, cooling being enhanced in a uh, in the outer regions of the storm. Uh, you can also have organization of the rain band complex by uh, tr uh, track motion. Um, and there's also SCFs that can occur in, uh, in simulations where there's actually a quiescent uh, environment. Um, a lot of those do, uh, when, when you show that you um, enhance the cooling uh, component of the, the simulation, 
then that uh, tends to increase the tendency, uh, the likelihood of secondary eye wall forming. But when we come back to the real world though, um, most storms have some degree of shear and or motion. So what I'm showing here is uh, when we have a uh, organized grand band complex, um, we have a, a, a mesoscale descending inflow um, that is a prominent feature that we saw across um, uh, multiple observed cases, and it's also a persistent feature in time, um, as we saw in the simulation, and I also saw it in Hurricane Earl. And it's most prominent, of course, in the downstream left quadrant. So uh, just to reiterate again, this was a plausible pathway for the transition from asymmetric rain bands to a mature secondary eye wall. And uh, this is not to say that um, it's the only pathway, and it's not to say that um, all of the secondary eye wall formation pathways are mutually exclusive, um, uh, but it is uh, one way in which it can contribute to um, other, di other theories, uh, such as the axisymmetric um, balance dynamics theory, where you have uh, these, uh, a, a concentrated region of a vorticity um, anomaly that can be created by these um, uh, organized rain band complexes uh, or, and by the NDI itself. So uh, the way that that would happen again is by the NDI uh, creating a sustained um, low level updraft through cold pool dynamics. And this updraft is uh, I think what does most of the work in terms of um, creating that low level vorticity anomaly um, and building the low-level jet and initiating the axisymmetric um, SCF processes. So these observations and model simulations show results that are consistent um, with the pathway that I showed before. And, and again, we're doing uh, this work and future work, we're investigating uh, the, the interactions with uh, these asymmetric, asymmetric dynamics and the environment so that we can improve our knowledge and forecasting of um, eyewall placement cycles. All right, so uh, with that, I will conclude. Thank you, everyone. Uh, how I miss applauses. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so now is a great time. If you have questions, I guess um, turn your camera on and or put in the chat, and we'll try to get to you. So um, I have a question. Oh, okay, Dave. Uh, Anthony, you talked about this phenomenon, a convective, sorry, stratiform convective transition. Uh, most of us, I think most of the time, think of uh, convective evolution as convective, and then you get this like stratiform mass, which rains out. So you're talking about something in reverse of that. Is that something that happens, you know, on land and other places? Um, so uh, when I say the, when we say the reverse of it. Um, well, I said the reverse. Oh, well, okay. Right, but. All right. So when I think about this, I, uh, I think of it as um, if you have your rain band complex, you have your, your convective to stratiform transition, which uh, I think we're well aware of. Now, the stratiform precipitation itself that's on one side of the storm is all sourced, uh, I think, from this convective region on the other side of the rain band complex. But yes. this uh, stratiform dynamics that are occurring right here um, help to trigger um, new updrafts, very similarly to how, uh, you know, your stratiform region in a squall line helps to sustain and trigger the uh, new updrafts in the convective region of the squall line. So that's what I think of in terms of a stratiform to convective transition. You're talking about evaporatively driven downdraft events coming back to the boundary layer and creating yeah. new updrafts. Yeah, and, and, and I think uh, melting cooling is one of the uh, is a equally, if not more important organizer in the tropical cyclones of the cooling. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah. Um, do we have other questions? Um, so um, Rob Roger, Rogers, I'll read this out loud for the recording. Um, this pathway has its origin in the down, uh, down to your left quadrant. How does the acceleration presumably confined to that quadrant ultimately occur at all azimuths? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a good question. Uh, definitely uh, azimuthal advection is a very uh, clear way in which that happens uh, for the upwind quadrants, I would say. 
Um, in the down to your right quadrant, um, it's very always convectively active and uh, you have, um, you still have vortex dynamics that are playing a key role um, in terms of uh, the rain band convection feeding its energy upscale and overall uh, uh, relaying its information to the entire uh, vortex itself. Um, so that's one way that I think about it. So a combination of both, um, if not, I'm not saying that they're mutually exclusive again, but a combination of um, azimuthal advection and overall vortex dynamics. That's my best answer right now. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Actually, the, the azimuthal uh, advection idea was something I hadn't thought about. So that was, I appreciated seeing that. I'm used to the radial component with the MDA that you've been talking about, but that azimuthal you know, downstream from the downshare right was uh, that's a nice addition, I think, to the idea. Yeah. Thank you. OK, um, Michael Fisher says, very interesting talk, Anthony. Do you think certain environmental conditions favor the MDI um, SEF pathway rather than other SEF mechanisms, uh, for example, certain SSTs or shear magnitudes? Um. Good question. All right, so if I think about just the way in which this would happen is that you need to have um, an organized rain band complex, which is more likely to happen in sufficiently strong shear. So moderate shear values and, and strong shear values is when you would have that rain band complex. But at the when you get, of course, to the larger shear um, uh, magnitudes, uh, nothing is capable of, um, or I guess SEF is much less likely um, just due to the fact that this, the, the storm may be tilted way too much. Um, so I would say for the SEF pathway, this is uh, the moderate values of shear um, uh, is, are, are pretty important. Now, I don't have a great answer for how, um, certain SSTs or uh, would play a role in other mechanisms or shear magnitudes in other mechanisms. Um, yeah, I'd have to think more about that. But definitely for the NDI SEF pathway, I would say moderate shear magnitudes. And I'm not, uh, uh, definitely want a, a, a low, a good threshold of SSTs as well. I have a quick question myself. Yeah. Um, is this, are these mechanisms something we could ever hope to see in real time, you know, in terms of like observing and forecasting or, um, you know, do you have any thoughts on like whether or not this could be predictive? Uh, yes. Um, so that's uh, definitely an avenue that uh, one of my current students is looking at right now by looking at, um, that's a, a natural, uh, uh, extension of the work is trying to see how predict with the predictability of this particular um, uh, mechanism, which I would argue is, uh, uh, well, I don't want to argue it until I prove it. Uh, so what we're doing is looking at ensemble um, simulations to get a sense of the sensitivity of, um, of this mechanism, uh, the ubiquity of this mechanism. Um, and from that, we'll get a good sense of what are the earliest features that we can uh, uh, find or identify for um, this evolution? Yeah, and as yeah, Rob just said that, yeah, the, those uh, NDI structures are, are something that are, they often observe in uh, the radar profiles during in real time. Okay. Yeah, I've sent them to you, Anthony, after a flight. Yeah. Like, hey, look at these, check this out, <laughs> right? Yep. Yeah. I know I remember one example uh, from Hurricane uh, Lane where the MDI was there, but I know that Lane didn't um, have a clear secondary eye wall that formed um, uh, after that MDI. But then I, but there was some strange inner core convection that was happening, which also, uh, you know, begs the question as to what exactly is a secondary eye wall? Um, how do you define that? Um, uh, that's one thing that Jean Godal 2017 talked about where you have, um, uh, I forgot the term he said, he called it a middling, uh, uh, eyewall replacement and not necessarily a full eyewall replacement. So there's, a, a there's room for gray here. 
gray area. Um, Roland, how, how are we on time? Can we go a few minutes over or we still have a question? You can do what you want. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so um, Sharon has a question. Um, Sharon says, hi, Anthony, enjoyed the seminar. Regards to the, the descending inflow, do you think it is associated with all rain bands or is it a special feature that plays a role in secondary eye wall formation? Uh, I think there's I think there's a gradient here um, where um, uh, I think that kind of speaks to what I was saying just now about Hurricane Lane, uh, where you can have um, a clear rain band complex. I would I would say that most rain band complexes have some degree of um, an MDI that may not necessarily be seen in um, radar observations. Uh, the, the strongest ones you can see in radar observations, um, but in uh, in the the paper that my student did um, to, in, that was published earlier this year, we didn't really find it very very clearly just by looking at the radial wind. Um, what you have to do is uh, subtract the um, the vortex flow. Uh, so subtract. So we decompose the wind um, into a rotational and um, non-divergent components or divergent and irrotational components. And what you see is that the MDI is most clear when you look at just the irrotational component of the radial inflow. And when you look at the irrotational component of the radial inflow, then which you can't really do in real time or with radar data, but when you do it with uh, simulations, then I would argue it's always there in some form and it's always coupled with um, clearly stratiform latent heat, latent cooling just because we know that they're tied dynamically as well, where your, your cooling uh, profile is going to influence the convergence. Um, I know there was a second part to that question, but yeah, so I wouldn't say that it's unique to secondary eye wall formation either. I have a question. Oh, yeah. So James, hi. Hey, great talk, Anthony. Um, Thank you. I'm just curious. A few former Penn Staters here. Yeah. <laughs> Old and young, no offense. <laughs> There's a lot of us out there. Yeah, I'm curious, have you looked at the, um, how this pathway is affected by the relative locations or the orientation of the storm relative motion vector to the shear vector? Because I'm wondering if, uh, if a lot of this is starting in the boundary layer with boundary layer convergence, if you have uh, kind of a quickly moving storm, um, and if the down shear left quadrant aligns with, let's see, the front right quadrant um, relative to the storm motion, if you would see enhanced convection and then kind of a, a, a higher efficiency of this process. Yeah, um, I haven't exactly looked at that, but that sounds like it um, would make a lot, a lot of sense knowing what we know about how uh, track motion plays a role in um, the asymmetric convection perturbations. So um, yeah, it would sounds like exact the condition that you would have here. We should see more enhanced rain band convection uh, from these two different uh, environmental sources. So, or so not sources, but environmental influences. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, any other questions before we uh, we end the seminar? Or hi, I'm Bernie. Oh, this is Jin. Hi, Jin. Um, yeah, nice talk. I'm actually in my car going to Lakeland or so I watching me. So very nice talk. So quite one question in your uh, asymmetric uh, dynamics. Have you looked at the ID direction terms? Like how large is this asymmetric, you know, the, the ID terms com compared to the mean direction term in your momentum budget? Um, yes. So uh, yeah, we definitely talk about that in our paper where we focus on, um, we didn't really focus on the mean versus eddy um, contribution because actually, is that a paper that we're writing right now? I think we're writing that one right now. Um, <laughs> so yeah, what we found uh, in our analysis that uh, hasn't been published yet is that um, at about the time where prior to that axis symmetrization, we found that the the eddy contribution, we did uh, this in terms of P a PV budget. 
Um, in terms of the eddy contribution, uh, it's largest um, prior and where the axisymmetric contribution is smaller uh, when you go into the secondary IO formation. But then once you I think it was about like hour 19 or 20, uh, they basically flip where the, the, the largest contribution becomes more um, from the axisymmetric terms rather than the eddy terms. And so there's a there's a that that's you know the clear uh, axis symmetrization that's happening um, at about the same exact time. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. June from the car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, anything yeah, else? I'm, I'm driving. I'm going to take a drive ending so I'm on the car. I stopped. Ben, you're not talking while you're driving, are you? That violates a rule for a few rules. The tree's so not I, moving I in the background. Oh, I parked. I parked on the okay. side of the highway. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I guess this is probably a good point to, I guess, end the seminar. So thanks to everyone who came and asked, and to Anthony for giving an incredible talk. There's so much there that um, I, I, I learned. So. Um, but, you know, of course, uh, if you have more questions for the speaker, you know, you can, of course, reach out as well. And, uh, yeah, anything else to add, Roland? All right. Well, thank you, Anthony, and thank you to everyone for coming. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Have a good one. Thanks, Anthony. Bye. Bye. Bye.